Hello, I am Miles Greer. I'm an assistant professor of English uh, at Queens College, City University of New York. Uh, I have one monograph that is due very shortly, um, as in due to, to appear. Uh, it's called Ink Face, and it actually builds on um, an essay that originally appeared in Dr. Wimbush's Scripturalizing the Human. Uh, and Ink Face is a history of Othello between 1604 and 1855. Uh, and the idea is that by looking at this particular black face performance, we can grasp hold of a history of race that's not an intellectual history, that's not a history of bad ideas, uh, but a history of media, media, uh, excuse me, mediation. Uh, and that uh, literally to grasp and to undo the racial problem we will have to change how we read and how we interact with media. So that uh, is Ink Face, possibly due in 2023. I, I hope it appears then because that will be the 400th anniversary of uh, the, the publication of Shakespeare's first folio. So there'll be a lot of attention uh, around Shakespearean material at that time. So that would be, a, that would be good timing. Uh, I have co-edited the volume Early Modern Black Diaspora Studies with Cassandra Smith and Nick Jones. Uh, the thesis of that volume is that Africans were not merely subject to the predations of the Atlantic world, but actually contributed to its formation on every level, economic, legal, intellectual. Uh, and I am hoping uh, at a later date uh, to actually produce um, a second volume that focuses particularly on Africans' contribution to the intellectual history of the Atlantic. Um, I have essays that have appeared in uh, the William and Mary Quarterly, uh, as I mentioned, Scripturalizing the Human, uh, and I have essays to come in Shakespeare Quarterly, uh, and I'll quickly mention uh, the, also the LA Review of Books. Uh, I'm especially happy to be here uh, Dr. Wimbush and I met virtually in 2013 and in person since. We think we may be cousins uh, through a distant relation. Um, I'm particularly happy to be here and very thankful uh, to him and to the Pitts Theology Library and looking forward to our conversation today. My presentation is really uh, jumping off from the provocation in Professor Wimbush's opening lecture to what extent the black flesh might and should serve as fraught synecdoche for the construction of modernities. Uh, I'd like to trace this thread from the opening lecture, uh, rewording it uh, and shifting it slightly. Uh, how did black flesh become a synecdoche uh, or in simpler but admittedly shifted terms the paradigm for the construction of modern social hierarchies. So uh, as a person who focuses on early modernity, um, that for me signals a sort of switch point. Um, and we don't often go before the 18th century uh, when we think about this. But uh, if we do, uh, I think we find an interesting way in which the blackened uh, racialized body uh, becomes the paradigm by which indigenous people, uh, indigenous to the to, to the Americas, uh, suspect white women, dishonored white men, unreliable laborers, uh, those who go native, uh, all become um, mediated as black. So uh, the first example I'd like to share to exemplify this is from Thomas Harriet's brief and true report on the state of Virginia from 1590. And uh, this particular pamphlet, which was designed to encourage English investment in colonizing schemes uh, in North America, uh, was accompanied by engravings by uh, de Bry. And uh, the engravings included uh, these depictions of indigenous peoples uh, of the region, the uh, Algonquin, and you will see uh, that the body itself, the back is tattooed 
Uh, and then the markings, tribal markings, which can convey status or achievement, uh, are then translated into a kind of European alphabetics. You see the Roman alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Uh, there is an attempt to therefore translate uh, the meaning of this people and their own distinctions into something that Europeans can both mentally uh, and politically conquer. And the medium of that conquest uh, is indeed uh, the alphabet, a kind of disregard uh, of native systems of marking. Um, now, um, also, however, in that volume of 1590, or excuse me, pamphlet, uh, we do have some depictions of a barbaric European past. And you'll notice that the Picts, that's P-I-C-T-S, um, an indigenous group of the British Isles uh, is here depicted as warlike, prone to decapitation, um, and also as marked and tattooed, um, much like the so-called new barbarians of the new world. And it's this transfer that I'd like to uh, focus on for the rest of the presentation. So um, with that, the Britons had previously served uh, as the paradigmatic slaves within a Greco-Roman context. Uh, in fact, the name of Britain um, and by the way, I hope I'm not sharing my screen anymore, uh, was associated with slave stigma. Um, slave tattoos were referred to in classical Rome as Britannum stagmatorum. According to Vincent Rosevach, uh, the slave population in Athenian democracy, uh, on which Rome based itself, was comprised first and foremost of foreign barbaroi, uh, or barbarians, uh, next by women and children of rival Greek city-states, and in rare and very recent cases, uh, men from the same. Uh, men had previously simply been executed rather than enslaved and conscripted. This enslavement of fellow Greeks required a cultural exertion uh, beyond that which would have, have obtained in the buying of alien slaves. The term barbarian had previously been a designation for foreigners who could not speak Greek, uh, barbar, uh, the sort of precursor of insults like mumbo jumbo, babble, voodoo. Uh, the Greeks deemed theirs the only language capable of generating reasonable statements. And so therefore barbaric speech was held to be indicative of the absence of higher order intellectual skills. Barbarians had their homelands and anatomical features roped into this enterprise. Uh, the very names of their birthplaces were used in Greek uh, uh, theater to designate slave status. Um, names like Lydian and Phrygian were ethnic labels that were nearly synonymous with the slave status uh, in classical Greek theater. Slaves uh, in the Greek context received names that drew attention to somatic features that the Greeks deemed foreign. Uh, examples would include Pyrrhus for redheads and Xanthius for blondes. These names, uh, interestingly, uh, as I've mentioned, come from Greek theater, which is a, a, an interesting sort of precursor to blackface uh, with, on which I will touch briefly. Uh, and I say that uh, not because black paint was being used, uh, but because certain somatic signifiers, in this case, atypical hair color, uh, gave away an origin that marked them as essentially enslavable. So before we accept the notion that Athenians and Romans enslaved other whites, people of their own race, uh, and I'm quoting Rosevac, uh, whom I greatly admire, but with whom I disagree on this point, um, I would actually argue that pan-European white identification had not taken hold in the classical world. So the Greeks and then subsequently the Romans actually had a tripartite racial system 
uh, in which pale Northerners who oriented around the Danube were as barbaric and therefore enslavable as darker peoples uh, declared Ethiopians, which literally meant burnt faced, uh, who were oriented around the Nile. Of particular interest to me, uh, considering the image of the tattooed Algonquin, is the fact that uh, in classical Rome, the transformation into a slave was closely linked to ink tattooing. Uh, C.P. Jones offers the following story from the Satirica, which was written in the first century AD. Characters who wished to desert a ship were concocting schemes for escape. Uh, one of them involves the ink, which uh, the poet Eumolpus has brought on board as a man of letters. In Colpius, one of the men who is seeking to escape, suggests that he and Gatan dye themselves with this writer's ink from head to foot and pretend to be Eumolpus' Ethiopian slaves. Prefiguring the stage blackamoors of the English Renaissance, the young men consider not just bathing in ink, but going so far as to mark themselves with letters, again, as the Algonquin uh, is translated. The poet suggests that the barber shave the heads and eyebrows of Inculpius and Gatan so that the poet can then quote, mark their faces with the elaborate, with an elaborate inscription to give the impression that they have been punished with a mark. That way, the same letters would both allay the suspicions of their pursuers and hide their faces with the appearance of punishment. So here, the application of ink conveys servile status. Now, uh, I was following the idea that in some ways, uh, at least within modernity, the black body becomes the sort of ground zero or the test case or the paradigm of this tattooing uh, and of this stigmatization. So I shift here to the early modern. In her history of early modern racial, uh, racialism, shades of difference, uh, the scholar Sujata Iyengar notes that quite aside from its botanical associations with plant stock and animal breeding, the word race shares the sense of being raised, that is marked, scarred, or tattooed. Iyengar derives this claim from William, William Towerson's report of his 1555 voyage to the coast of Guinea. And I quote from that here, and I just note uh, the date uh, prior to the engravings of the Algonquin. Quote, the most part of them have their skin of their bodies raced with diverse works in a manner of a leathern jerkin. Iyengar concludes that the Negro's skins are raced in two sentences, quote, two senses, excuse me. Quote, they bear the marks of their own cultural affiliation and the gaze of a distancing colonial eye. The cultural mark and the imperial, I would even say imperious, abstraction into race in which mark and skin color become a jerkin, that is a vest that encompasses the person and announces a definite social station. Here, natal complexion, autochthonous status mark and European ascription are assembled. Epidermis, tattoo, brand or incision, and vestment, the natural and the artificial, that which can be removed and that which is indelible are all made interchangeable as ways of signifying something essential or innate. That I would argue um, much more so than making a separate caste of Africans uh, is the goal uh, of this particular mode of stigmatization. Uh, I would actually say that blackness becomes this elastic category into which indigenous people of the Americas, um, white women who um, fail in their duty to reproduce the race. Uh, so I'm thinking of people like Desdemona, um, well, characters like Desdemona, um, white men who go native and, and join with indigenous people uh, can all be cast into this uh, elastic category because blackness uh, is not entirely of the skin, uh, but has actually been aligned with clothing, 
paint, uh, some of which are removable. Uh, so part of what I would argue then is that if we're going to think about racialized blackness, we must always think about the materials that are used to convey it because those materials have physical properties that actually affect the thinking around blackness and therefore uh, give it new properties and modes of behavior, uh, making it as susceptible to uh, rigid biological versions of race uh, but also state-imposed state uh, criminality and um, a more flexible cultural version of race, uh, as we actually heard a bit before in the French context. So uh, I'd like to conclude with a little section on what I think uh, can be done. Uh, and I offer it uh, in part because uh, the exhibition includes uh, Toni Morrison's Beloved. And I just wanted to turn to a different Morrison text for uh, a moment here. I want to think specifically about Song of Solomon, which we certainly could think of as a new scripture, given that she has appropriated the name of that psalm. Um, you'll recall that the protagonist of Song of Solomon is uh, Milkman Dead. Uh, however, in Morrison's hand, the dead name is not simply the master name imposed upon a blank. Rather, it is a Euro-American scribe misplacement of a black freedman's words on a government form. In Morrison's imagination, it would appear that New World Africans have no original Africa to which to return, but might at least renegotiate our relationship to our dead names that have been misplaced and mistranslated. In Song of Solomon, uh, Milkman's Aunt Pilot is the organic theorist of just such a new relationship. Uh, Morrison, in a sort of line that would almost seem a throwaway, discusses Pilot's appearance as follows. Her blueberry colored lips looked as if she had put on lipstick, but blotted away the shine on a scrap of newspaper. There, Morrison imagines a woman whose mouth could leave its imprint on the supposedly impersonal and objective medium of the print newspaper, which so often serves as an organ of upholding the commercial and sexual relations of racial capitalism as inevitable, unremarkable, uh, a text which cannot be answered to. So uh, recently, the literary scholar Madhu Dubey has argued that Morrison evinces a distrust of the print medium and uh, a kind of romance of orality uh, but what I see here instead, and Dubé is another scholar whom I greatly admire, uh, but what I see here instead is that Morrison is imagining a renegotiation with print uh, in which the oral is no longer subordinate, um, but is actually also capable of imprinting in the same way uh, that Pilate's uh, lips in that metaphor leave uh, a mark on the printed page, uh, the, the sort of paradigmatic European medium. Why should this be a way of imagining the future for dispersed Africans? Precisely because it accepts that something has been altered. Our dead names are an inheritance that perhaps cannot simply be discarded, although the increasing assertion of trans-inspired self-naming practices um, may suggest otherwise. But these impositions, these tattoos, these stigma can be spoken back to, brought back to an equal footing with the oral. Thank you.